Hello and welcome to the Wellspring Tabernacle Podcast. Wellspring Tabernacle is a Bible-based Trinitarian Christian church in Marble, North Carolina. We seek to impact our community through preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ in power and demonstration of the Spirit of God. Thank you for listening to today's episode, and may God bless. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Glad you're here this morning. Um, I know it seems like that the past few weeks sermons have been kindly rough, but y'all just y'all hang in here with me because we're going to we're going to get past the rough patch and I'll tell you the reason that it's been so rough is because in this study of revival and what it takes to see and live in genuine revival God has shown me that he accepts no less a standard than perfection. And while we will never attain perfection in this life, we belong to a God who is perfect and who enables us to live above the sin and degradation of this world. Paul told Timothy to live righteous and godly here in this present world. And it is only by and through the the Lord Jesus and our relationship with him that we're able to do that. So today we're going to venture outside the church. We're going to go where you live quite literally. Uh, we're going to look at another step of revival that happens in your home. And I don't by, by saying in your home, I don't mean that we should all hold church services in our homes, but that our lives and our homes should be places and things that glorify God. According to Scripture, it's possible to do everything in our lives directed towards and giving glory to God. If you have a Bible this morning, go ahead and turn over to the book of Matthew, chapter number 7. And while you're turning there, I want to let you know the vast majority of churchgoers believe that their church life and their personal life are separate from one another and only intersect when we comment thoughts and prayers on a Facebook post. And that simply isn't true, all right? If you are born again, if you are saved, then you should strive in every aspect of your life to give glory and honor to God. And that includes what we do inside our home. And in my opinion, inside our home are the play, is the place that we should give glory and honor to God the most. All right, so in Matthew chapter 7, we find a teaching from the Lord himself. Verses 21 and following are, are the conclusion of this teaching, and they show us the full view of the indispensable necessity of being completely obedient to the command of Christ in everything we do, both in and outside the church. So in Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 21, the Bible says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell not for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. 
Lord Jesus, we are so thankful for this time you've given us to lay the world aside, God, to gather out to worship you in spirit and in truth. God, we thank you for the spirit we have felt in our worship service this morning. And God, now we pray as the preaching time has come, Lord, that you would touch God, that you would let your word go out and not return void, Lord, that your, that it would fall on good ground this morning. And God, we thank you for everything you're going to do, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. God, I pray that you would allow, that you'd hide me behind the cross this morning and touch me afresh. God, fill me with the Holy Ghost this morning and help me to preach as you've given it to me this morning. In Jesus' mighty name, we do pray. Amen. But in this text, we see a few things. We see a group of people who are un unnamed. We see two builders and we see two houses. The nameless people in this text are directly connected to the two builders. One of these builders said, Lord, Lord, and did the will of the Father, building his house on the rock. The other said, Lord, Lord, and didn't do the will of the Father and built his house on sand. The same storm came to both houses. One stood firm and the other one fell. What was the difference between these two? All right, the first First three verses of our text sends a chill down people's spines. All right, this these are the recorded words, and they are the most terrifying words that Jesus ever spoke in all of the Bible. All right, he begins with a laying down the law, so to speak, saying that not everyone who says Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. All right, that eternal kingdom of grace and glory. He says here that lip service will not suffice. All right, and lip service is something we have a great problem with in the church today. People who live and enjoy every sort of hell you can imagine will claim to know Jesus and be a partaker of the divine nature and under the grace of, and under the grace of God. They'll say these things with their lips, but they live their lives as if He doesn't exist and that the consequences of their rebellion against Him are irrelevant. We find this same theme fleshed out more in Matthew 15 where Jesus says that people draw close to him with their mouths and honor him with their lips, but that their hearts are far from him. They've said, Lord, Lord, but they aren't part of the kingdom. Why aren't they part of the kingdom? Because they don't do the will of the Father. It's the, and it's, it is the only those who do the will of the Father and obey the command of the gospel to believe and repent that have a part in the kingdom. These people are building their houses on a rock. All right? Those who build their houses on the rock or I'm sorry, those who build their houses, they built their house on sand, all right? They've said, Lord, Lord, but they haven't done the will of the Father, all right? And they build their house on sand, and one day it'll come crashing down around them. All right, Matthew Henry said in his commentary, talking about the will of God in this particular passage, he said, now this is his will, that we believe in Christ, that we repent of sin, and that we live a holy life, that we love one another. If we don't comply with the will of God, we mock. Christ in calling him Lord. But Jesus came, looking at verses 22 and 23, Jesus came to establish a new thing. Isaiah 43, 19, God says, Behold, I shall do a new thing, and shall you not know it? And this new thing would not be in, only in words, but in power. 1 Corinthians 4.20, Paul says, My preaching to you was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in power and demonstration of the Spirit of God. In these verses, all right, Jesus tells us that, a, that an outward profession, no matter how remarkable, will not to take it, will not take us to heaven unless there is, once again, going to Matthew Henry, as he puts it, a correspondent conversation. Look at our text. All right, this conversation is one-sided. The people have a lot to say, but God wasn't responding. Look at the text. All right, they say, "Lord, have we not done X, Y, Z?" We see this in the church today. We, when you see popular ministers, whether on TV or online, they are extremely self-centered, especially those. And I'm going to, I am going to beat this drum until somebody starts to jump along with the to, with the beat. All right, especially in the charismatic and Pentecostal world. Sadly, there's a trend within all of Christianity to give the most extreme whack jobs a huge platform, and charismatics are some of the absolute 
absolute worst. Millions of people will elevate those who preach a man-focused humanistic message rather than Christ. And why do we do that? Because we like to think that we have that we're something special. News flash this morning, honey. God's no respecter of persons. Just this week, I watched a video of a very popular deliverance minister. In the video, this lady was saying, I bind this and I break that. Church, I want to be as plain as I can be this morning. I, I'm telling you, I, I'm so sick of this man-centered, godless junk. All right, we cannot do anything. The triune God of heaven does it or it does not get done. We can't cast out a devil, but God can. We we can't heal anyone, but God can. We can't prophesy, but God can. Does God use people as his instruments to do these things? Yes, he does. But does that mean the individual's given credit for it? Absolutely not. All the credit, all the glory, and all the honor belong to God Almighty. The people Jesus describes in our passage are just like the people today. They've removed Christ from their faith and they trust in themselves. It's not Christianity that we see by and large today, but selfianity. Yes, that's it, that's it. They, like so many that we mentioned last week, claim to know Jesus and yet the power that comes in and through not only knowing of the triune God, but genuinely knowing Him is not evident in their lives. There's no transforming power at work in them. <laughs> How do we know this power is lacking? Because rather than obedience, they offer up other things. Look at what Jesus said. He said, only those who do the will of the Father will be welcomed into the kingdom of heaven. Those in our text prophesied in his name, but they weren't sent by him. They used his name for self-glory. They cast out devils. Well, so did Judas Iscariot, and he was the son of perdition. All right, Origen, an early church father, said that in his day, invoking the name of Jesus to cast out devils, was so common that even wicked people could do it. They did many wonderful works. Great works of faith don't necessitate justifying faith. All right, Grace will bring a man to heaven without miracles, but miracles never brought anyone to heaven without grace. Think about this. The Bible said that Enoch walked with God and was not because he was taken. And I want you to understand something this morning. Enoch didn't have a Bible. He didn't have the cross. He wasn't baptized in the Spirit. He never spoke in tongues. He never saw, from what we know, he never Ever saw anyone healed, but he still walked with God in obedience. How much more should those of us who have the word of God can look back to the cross and are indwelt with the Spirit be able to walk with Him in that same obedience? Those Christ describes here are the definitive case of 2 Thessalonians 2, which says, And then, and then shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the Spirit of His mouth and destroy with the brightness of His coming. Even him whose coming is after the work of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, listen, for this cause, God gave them over to strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. All of these actions accolades, all right, that we read about these people in this text, all right. All of their accolades were worth nothing because in all of their doing, they still hadn't done the will of the Father. The will of the Father concerning the gospel message of His Son. Jesus came to this earth to do the will of the Father, to offer Himself as the all to end all sacrifice for the sin of man. He was our substitute to the justice demanded by God's law. And with that victorious shout of it is finished. He did just that. Now the will of the Father for believers is to spread the gospel to every nation. Yes. Go back in our text and look at what these people say. They never said anything about sharing the gospel. They claimed all sort of miraculous things, but they never did the greatest thing. The greatest display of the power of God on earth is not in healing. It's not in prophecy. It's not in casting out devils. The greatest display of the power of God on earth is what Paul said in Romans 6, 1.16. 
He said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it, the gospel, is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. But these people had never said anything about sharing the gospel. The greatest thing that any Christian can ever do is share the gospel with someone else. I heard a very popular internet minister say that if someone's been a Christian for any length of time and hasn't cast out a devil, it's a sign they're not truly saved. Show that to me in the Bible. How many people claim to do mighty works in the name of Jesus but never do the one thing that matters above all else? To deliver, as Paul said, that which we first received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried and rose again according to the Scriptures. The gospel is what matters. And if we aren't sharing the gospel, regardless of how gifted we may be, we have no part in the kingdom, friend. If you have not placed your faith and your trust in the Son of God and His finished work on the cross and His resurrection from the dead, friend, then you have no part in the kingdom. You can say Lord, Lord all you want to you can prophesy, you can do all the, let me tell you about prophecy alright, because we have a tendency to get sideways over prophecy, let me tell you something, there were people in the Old Testament that were wicked and served heathen gods that could prophesy just as much as the ones that were sent from the Lord speak it, speak it. that's true, that's true, that's true here's the dilemma that we have in the church today we see lots of gifts, but we see no gospel. We see lots of puffing up man and telling people you can have your best life now, but we see no gospel. And that, this morning, is why the vast majority of the church is built on sand. If we hope to see revival, we've got to have a firm grasp on who Jesus is. And I, I'm telling you, and I know that we pick, I, I, I say we, I pick on different denominations from time to time, but I tell you this, I thank God that when I was growing up and I was going to a Baptist church one week and to a church of God the next week, I thank God that them old time saints may not have been able to read too well. They not have, might not have been able to write anything but their own name. But I can tell you what they instilled in me. It was the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ week in and week out regardless of what name was on the door. Nowadays you go to a Baptist church, you don't hear the gospel. They want to get a committee together to do this, that or the other. All right, you go to the church of God, they're going to tell you about talking in tongues but they won't tell you the gospel. Friend of mine, if we hope to see revival, we've got to have the gospel as the bedrock and as the structure of our message. The Bible puts it so simply, all right, on, the, on having a grasp on who Jesus is. The Bible puts it so simply in Romans 10 that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Don't go through your life thinking that if you do this or that, you'll be all right once judgment day comes. Be sure beyond any doubt that you know that Jesus knows you. All right, and these next few verses bring this to light even more. All right, this brings us to that next line. And I and this should render anyone who in their heart of hearts wonders if they've ever truly been saved. This should render you catatonic this morning. The Bible says that our Lord Jesus will say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. The phrase, I never knew you, should terrify everyone. We have a common belief spread across the earth, the world today that quote unquote, everyone is a child of God. Let me burst your bubble this morning. We are not all God's children. We are all God's creation and we bear His image, but we are not all His children. To be a child of God, 
God, we must receive Christ. John's gospel says, and to as many as received him, Jesus, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. We don't become a child of God until we receive Christ and are given faith to believe. If you haven't received Christ on the terms of the gospel, by grace through faith, you are a child of God. Christ doesn't know you. And once again, we find this language of knowing. All right, Christ certainly knows about the people described here. He knows their works. He knows the wickedness that lies in their heart. But he doesn't and has never known them as his bride because he hasn't known them in that intimate, personal way. He will say, depart from me. And then we go, we come to verses 24 through 27. It's a very, very familiar passage and it's been called the tale of two builders. Both of these people heard the words of Jesus. Both people heard his message of faith and repentance. They both heard the gospel and they had a reaction to it. And we see this same thing play out, this same scenario plays out in churches. In churches, you get three reactions to the gospel being preached. You get saints who rejoice. You have sinners who respond with hatred and vitriol. And you have sinners who respond by faith and become saints. Paul said in 1 Corinthians, there are only two types of people in this world, and he was right. There's us who are saved and those who are perishing. We see this play out in Matthew 7. One person hears it and listens. The other person hears it and spurns it. We see this in the way that they built their houses. One built his house on a rock. He built his house on that stone the builders rejected that's now become the head, head of the corner. He built his house on the chief cornerstone. This man built his house on Christ. The other man built his house on the sand. A bad foundation for any building, but especially for life. We see this play out when the storm came. The storms come and the floods rained out on the first house and this house stands firm. Hear me and hear me well this morning. If your life is built on Christ, it'll withstand anything that comes. Betrayal, pain, hurt, disaster, calamity and despair, even death all bow down to Jesus. A house that's built on the rock of ages will stand and those who live in that house will also stand. If we were to open the door on a house filled with people who are established on Christ, regardless of what's going on on the inside, we would see people who are doing everything in their lives to glorify God. When we look at things this way, we see truly that not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, has got it all nailed down. All right, Only those who do the will of the Father. All right, Remember what I said back at the beginning of the message? People today believe that outside the church they can live and behave however they want to but when we look at the word of God we see that differently we see that every area of our lives should be directed towards glorifying God all right if you're a believer then your your main point of existence is to give God glory let me explain how that works when you go to work you're providing for your family Caring for your family glorifies God because you're being obedient to His Word. The Bible says a man that won't care for his family is worse than an infidel. When you feed yourself, it gives your body the energy it needs to, to care for your family and to glorify God. When you raise your children in the way and admonition of the Lord, it gives glory to God. Men, when we take up our duties as head of household, loving our wives as Christ loved the church, it glorifies God. Ladies, when you submit yourself to your husband, being the helpmate God designed you to be, it glorifies God. In short, there is nothing outside of the realm of giving God glory for a saved person. There are certain things that I refuse to do because it might compromise my faith. There's music I can't listen to. There's TV shows I can't watch. There's books that I can't read. All right, It isn't that I physically can't do these things. All right, and before anybody cries out, oh, that's legalism, that's legalism, let me explain to you something. Paul said that all things were possible for him, but not everything was beneficial. That's right. There we go. It isn't that I can't physically do those things. It's that doing those things doesn't glorify God and they don't give me any benefit either. On the other hand, we have another builder. His house was built on sand. Out of all the foundations to exist, sand would be the worst to build on. 
Sand isn't stable. Sand moves with wind and tide. Jesus says the one who builds their house on sand is foolish. These are the people who rather than obeying the gospel spurn it. They believe their lives are better off without Jesus in it. And this belief is so prevalent today it would shock you to know how many people think this way. And one of the greatest reasons that people do think this way is because of the godless sin they see professing believers in. When we look like the world and act like the world in front of the pe the lost people in the world, yeah. it destroys our testimonies and brings shame to the name of Jesus. Yeah. All right, and y'all hear me this morning. Think about the eternity of the person you're next to the next time you decide to give in to your flesh and willfully sin. Because it might truly make the difference. The difference between being established on a rock and, and, and building on sand. When the storms of life come, this house built on sand. When the betrayal comes, when the calamity comes, when the despair comes, when the pain comes, when the death happens in the family, that house that's not built on Christ is going to be decimated. I've watched it play out time after time after time after time. True Christians can go through hell and shout while the flames are licking their heads. Those who don't have Jesus don't have that hope because of their hopeless existence when the inevitable happens and their world falls apart. They have nothing to trust in or to hope for. Which one are you? Do you live your life for the glory of God or is your house built on sand? If you're here this morning and don't know who Jesus is, I want to let you know today is the day of salvation. If you've been living a life that's hopeless, there's hope. If you think no one cares, He does. Come to Him. Come to Jesus this morning. If you're a Christian who strayed far from God, He's right where you left Him. If you're like the prodigal and you've been living in the hog pen, the Father is waiting with arms wide open for you to come home. Don't wait. Don't hesitate. Come to Him. What this got to do with revival? What does all this have to do with revival? All right, first of all, if you don't know who Jesus is, friend, you ain't never going to take part in revival. All right, we've got to let our yeses be yeses this morning and let our nays be nays. All right, and if you don't have your life, if you don't have the household of your soul built and established on Christ, you ain't never going to see revival either, friend. It takes digging down to the foot of the cross, son. And get down there on that blood stained rock that is Christ and build your house on it. Yes, praise you, Father. Praise you. And if you do that, if you build your house on that rock, Amen. then your house is going to stand. And you'll be able to live this life of holiness, this life of sanctification, this life of let everything you do, whether in eating or in drinking, let all be done to the glory of God. It's, we need to get over this, oh, I'm just an old sinner saved by grace mindset. No, 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 no. And I'm not saying what I'm about to say just to get y'all to shout. I'm saying it because it's the truth. When God saved you, you stopped being a sinner at that moment. The Bible says in Colossians 1.13 that He has delivered you from the powers of darkness and translated you into the kingdom of His dear Son. Friend, this morning we've got to wake up and realize that that old man was crucified with Christ. Paul said, this life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Friend, I was crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I but Christ in me, friend. Yes, yes, yes. And this life that Christ has birthed in us is not an old sinner saved by grace. When God saved me, I instantaneously became a royal priesthood and a chosen generation. I immediately became hid with God in Christ. And when He when He hid me, 
With God in Christ, he said, all right, son, the way you've been living is not going to cut it no more. I've given you my free gift. I've given you my grace freely. But now there are some standards that come with this thing. And, and church, if we, we won't ever see revival if we don't get back to the standard of grace that God gives us in his word. Stop chasing after the flashy business. Stop chasing after those who might prophesy in his name and in his name cast out devils and get down to doing the will of the Father. Amen. 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 Only that because this is this is the, the problem. This it all comes down to this. Too many people in the church are waiting on a move of God to start rather than moving with God all the time. God has never stopped moving. He never slumbers or sleeps. He hadn't gone on a long he hadn't gone on vacation, church. He's right there. He's moving all the time. Searching just as Isaiah said for one that would go and tell who is going to stand up and say, Here am I, send me. If your house is built on the rock, you're one of those that said, here am I, send me. If your house is built on sand, just like the foundation you're built on, you're wishy-washy. I've stood on sand before, all right? There's some times where sand is firm. And there's other times where you sink. But, if, but I've never stood on a solid rock that had any give whatsoever to it. And I've stood on I've stood on some. I've climbed mountains. I've stood on some rocks. I know what having that firmness. But it, it secures me, I tell you. I'm terrified of heights. I don't like heights. I don't like getting up high. I like for my feet to be on something solid. A whole lot of Christians need to take word of that. A whole lot of churchgoers need to take need to take heed to that. Get your head out of the clouds yes, and get Father. back to the firm foundation that is Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Yes. But like I said, if you're here this morning and you don't know who Jesus is, if you live in that life that's hopeless, if you live in that life that's that, where you think no one cares and nobody loves you, there's hope for the helpless, yeah. there's rest for the weary, and there's love for the brokenhearted in Jesus this morning. Right. Come to Him. Right. Come to Him. The Bible says, call upon Him while He's near and seek Him while He may be found. That's true. Come to the Lord this morning. Come to Jesus. Thank you for listening to today's episode of the Wellspring Tabernacle Podcast. If you feel led to do so, please give us a review on the platform of your choice. And if you would like to reach out to us further, please email us at wellspringtabernaclenc at gmail.com. Until next week, may God bless you.